hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide Atanasidis from uh, Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode we will talk about some original topics we haven't covered yet. Uh, we will talk about the metabolic, cyborg, and post-political city. Uh, for this, we will have to provide some urban political ecology and critical slash Marxist geography foundations. Um, to talk about these uh, topics, I have Eric Swigidau, professor of geography at the University of Manchester. And he has written numerous, more than 100 uh, academic articles and books on, on these topics, including uh, In the Nature of Cities, um, Urban Political Ecology and the Politics of Urban Metabolism, which was co-edited with uh, Nick Heinen and Marik Maria Kaika. So just before kicking off this episode, Uh, please, everyone, if you like this podcast, just spread it around and uh, review it positively wherever you can uh, by telling us what you learned and liked from this episode. So now let's, uh, let's start with the episode. Eric, thank you very much for your time and welcome to this podcast. It's a pleasure. Uh, could you very briefly present um, or how do you generally present yourself and your work? Um... That's not that easy. Uh, I am Alex Wengerdau, as you said, professor of geography uh, at the University of Manchester, but I had a fairly strange trajectory in the sense that I have a background in engineering, uh, agricultural and environmental engineering, um, uh, which I did with an eye towards um, improving the social and environmental conditions of the world's populations, particularly those who are living in very difficult circumstances. But I quickly learned that technology and science in itself would not get us there. And I increasingly moved uh, towards considering the question of the social, the political, etc., as key ingredients in thinking through how social ecological dynamics work and how we can manage them or organize them in different ways. That very that very very quickly took me to um, the critical social sciences. I did a master's in urban planning where I discovered at the time the critical theories of the urban, um, people like David Harvey, Harvey Lefebvre, et cetera, basically a kind of critical Marxist analysis that tries, that tried to make sense of the deep social and other inequalities that characterize everyday life, both in the global north and the global south. And uh, uh, I ended up doing my PhD in geography um, with David Harvey, uh, quite uh, well-known Marxist geographer, uh, with whom I've worked for many, many, many years. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, although I was originally primarily concerned with questions of technology, politics, and the transformation of capitalism in the 1970s and 1980s, By the late 1980s, it became increasingly evident that the ecological condition um, uh, was on the one hand, not sufficiently theorized or understood. And on the other hand, um, that the ecological condition presented itself as a sort of potential wedge, an opening into acting, thinking and acting on and in the world, on and in the city in different sort of ways. So from the 1990s onwards, uh, I have increasingly worked on and still do on questions of political ecology. So I call myself a political ecologist. Basically for me, a political ecologist is someone who tries to understand the intimate articulations and relationships between the human and the non-human, the social world and the physical world, but such that the two cannot be separated out. For too long, of course, we've understood the world as being strangely organized in two hemispheres, a world called the human and a world called the non-human. And there were, assumedly, there were all sorts of interactions between the two. And of course, that is now increasingly recognized as a, as a fallacy. 
uh, and what your political ecology tries to do is to is to look back and look again at the world, but this time keeping the social and the physical, the human and the non-human yet together uh, uh, um, as an imbroglio that is inherently co-constituted and has to be understood in its co-constitutive uh, configuration. And for me, so indeed, I call myself an urban political ecology, but the urban really doesn't matter that much <laughs> in the sense that in the sense that for me, all your political economy and related to that, your political ecology is inherently urban, particularly so since the 18th, 19th century, and today, increasingly so. If you were to think, for example, of the political ecology of the of the coronavirus, that's an urban political ecology. <laughs> it's the process of planetary urbanization that shaped the dynamics of this pandemic that we're still living in. So to the extent, to conclude now uh, this long introduction, to the extent that the urban or the process of urbanization has become yet yeah, planetary. I mean, most people, in the, not only do most people of the world live in cities, but that's just a stupid empirical fact. In fact, the process of urbanization uh, now touches every nook and cranny of the Earth's uh, social and ecological surface. And of course, the way in which the process of urbanization unfolds is deeply uneven, socio-ecologically speaking. And it's precisely that socio-ecological unevenness that characterizes the process of urbanization that I'm interested in, A and B. The reason I'm interested in examining and excavating the socio-ecological uh, um, uh, the socio-ecological archaeology of the urbanization of nature, as I call it, we may come back to that uh, later, that for me, dealing with or the politically handling the deep inequalities uh, that, of course, characterize the world's urban social ecologies uh, it requires that the mechanisms of doing politics, whether that is through social movements or social activism or by, uh, by other means, has to primarily focus on the dynamics of that socio-ecological process. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, you summarized everything so well, it's it's tough to, to keep up with a good question now. Um, so I'm wondering, I had this idea, so I had written down, I'm, I'm glad that you're mentioning this, uh, your your trajectory or your research, uh, how you, you went from the agricultural engineering to urban planning and then to political elements of urban planning, let's say, or the yeah. politics of urban planning. And I'm wondering, you said very rapidly you realize technology it's not gonna yeah. make the cut uh, sure. this generally takes us decades to figure this out how very how did you very early on consider it or realize that well engineering is just part of the the challenge especially yeah. that we're taught as engineers that we're dealing with issues right and we're finding solutions that's our job how, how sure. did sure. how did you came across that uh, so so early on uh, well, it was a, a strange coincidence, so to speak. Of course, I grew up in, in, in the 1970s. Uh, I, I gained my political consciousness as well as my ac academic understanding in the 1970s. And that context matters, of course, massively. Um, um, I, I grew up as a teenage, teenage activist, as so many others, uh, on primarily ecological and environmental issues. So at the time, the 1970s, living in Belgium, the nuclear energy conundrum was the sort of pivotal terrain through which um, um, environmental action um, was um, uh, organized and which was um, basically the, 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 the foundation of what we would, would today call the environmental movement. That's where, where it found its, its, its roots. So I get... I get Extra, extremely concerned and upset that some environmentalists today portray nuclear energy as a solution for our climate <laughs> problem. So that is one of the great contradictions and paradoxes of our times. Uh, in 
in any case, at the same time, um, I was heavily involved in other forms of political and social action. But for a number of contextual reasons, I was groomed to be an engineer because engineering, <laughs> given the cultural and social context I, I came from, I was the first one in my family ever to go to university and becoming an engineer was the sort of um, um, dream scenario. Uh, and given my interest in, in ecological affairs, I did think that of course that would be a good trajectory mm -hmm. if I were to continue to work on questions of um, development, uh, ecologically sensible the development with an eye towards the deep injustices or dealing with the deep injustices that I could see uh, everywhere around me. And I still think of course that technology really matters, um, but it became clear after the four or five years of long study um, that although technology is absolutely vital, obviously that the way in which the sort of modernist um, idea of technological the progress that would solve the world's the problems as well as elevate everyone in the world to a higher level of development, which, which was just a fantasy, a fantasy sustained by very particular yeah, political and economic interest and to serve very particular sort of objectives. I did at the time not have the, the words the, and the knowledge to frame that, but I, I could sense it. And of course, when I discovered as a student activist um, at university, the work of Marx, Reading uh, Capital, Volume One, uh, et cetera, it, it, it was increasingly evident, increasingly evident that a critical political economic analysis help me to, to understand why this modern dream of technological progress in the interest of all quickly descends into this, this, this combined and uneven development whereby some people get thrive while others are suffering precisely because of the thriving of others that I became interested in in, in, in the political the questions and that I felt the urgent need to deepen that. And that combined with a with deep interest in the question of the urban, given the rapid process of urbanization, whereby I saw both the origin of the socio-ecological inequalities, uh, as well as the solutions consequently, in how the urban environment uh, was being thought about and how the urban environment was managed and that that combination um, um, drove me ultimately to becoming a political ecologist. Ultimately, ultimately, the, the key point to conclude this, the key point is that I have uh, been always been concerned with questions of the political inequality, social inequality, and it was that concern that drove my search for appropriate epistemological and theoretical and empirical uh, perspectives that would guide my academic research. So it's, it's not theory that drove me to it. It was a concern with questions of social ecological inequality that drove me to, 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 to explore a particular set of theoretical and empirical concerns that I would argue, still would argue, are, the, are among the key perspectives that we need to consider if we want to take seriously the profound socio-ecological inequalities that characterize our contemporary world. Yeah, and, and then you, so you did your master in urban studies and then you did your PhD uh, with, uh, with David Harvey on, if I understand correctly, is the production of new spaces of production, was that like a... That was uh, the title of my PhD, yes. Yeah, w was that like a, a remembrance of uh, Henri Lefebvre's work on the production of... Uh, of yeah, but did you actually look at who makes the space or who, is it manufacturing? Is it the, the politics? How, how do you, what did you look at? Yeah, so, so in, in a nutshell, um, um, this, I was doing my, my PhD in, in, the, in the early 80s, 1980s, at a time of profound, profound the political economic change. We'd just gone to this, mass wave of deindustrialization with, 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 with devastating consequences, of course, for the social fabric in old and what we now call, call old industrial 
regions, while at the same time we did see what again was imagined as a purely technological <coughs> shift to what we would today call the high tech, what was then called actually the high technology, <laughs> in, the high technology, which today we would call the, the IT sector, uh, right? the Silicon Valley phenomena, which was characterized by a completely different uh, set of social relations, um, uh, work relations, geographies of production and geographies of consumption and different the political embeddings of these new techno socio-technical forms of organization. So I, I, I was interested in the, the political dynamics and the social struggle dynamics that were integral to the process of this the transition from what I called together with many, many others at the time, uh, uh, one regime of accumulation to another regime of accumulation, very much based on the French regulation school that argues that every, every uh, uh, social system is a combination of a particular dominant forms of socio-technical organization, like assembly lines, mass production, etc. in the post-war period to niche specialist, uh, uh, high-tech based the production, flexible systems in the 1980s, 1990s, that these shifts were always also paralleled by profound changes in the way in which the political configuration was socially embedding or socially regulating these kind of um, the processes. So I was particularly concerned with how, uh, just to name a few, the process of financialization, the deregulation of the international financial system, the deregulation of the welfare state, uh, of collective bargaining, the classic year 20th century forms of, of regulating and organizing capital labor relationships, how they were rapidly changing uh, uh, as a result of a shift in class dynamics, the increasing force of the capitalist the class in the 1980s that would be extremely successful in pushing through what today we would call neoliberalization um, uh, and which has now become a, 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 a fully embedded dogma, so to speak, that cannot even longer be fundamentally a question. So my PhD, in a nutshell, was about historical, geographical, the political and economic dynamics of historical, geographical shifts in the technical mode of organizing the production on the one hand, and its social embedding, in particular, uh, governance regimes and forms of organizing the capital labor relationship. Uh, and through that, of course, new spaces of production emerged, like the Silicon Valleys, uh, uh, the side of France, and the, the new spaces of high tech the production, while others would, would the decline, uh, the, uh, disintegrate, and deindustrialize. So I was interested in that seesawing dynamics of historical geographical change animated by the specific dynamics of capitalism at a given time in a particular environment. And this, um, so I think, of course, many of your work um, is influenced by, let's say, this vocabulary that you use. The it could be the the the, the Marxist political political vocabulary. Yes. We talk about production. We talk about means of production. We talk about yes. workers, labor, yes. uh, geog. Well, and then there is the geography part of it. And, and so uh, it's really this intersection. What is the space it, of it, a production? It, it, what is it, it, it is? Yes, but it's more than an, in, than an intersection. Um, there had been a long history whereby we, we understood the geographical organization of the world as a result of social, technical, political, or other processes. So space was just a container uh, and the effects of basically social processes. We disagreed with that, and it's now, I think, firmly, firmly, firmly estab established. So what 
I tried to argue in my PhD together with many others at the time was that the geographical is a key active moment in the making of social the processes. And today, I think uh, um, we can even push that further. At the time, we were primarily interested in and concerned with space as a social, cultural, political condition. Today, of course, it is the, the very physicality of space that has, has become much more foregrounded and how the very physicality, uh, uh, the non-human configurations combined with the human become active moments, as we call, call active moments in the way in which socio-ecological systems change. So this kind of uh, brings forward the question, whenever you, you talk about the city, it, well, there is so many elements uh, that are embodied in this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 How, how do you even start by defining a city or do you even bother defining a city before explaining something? Are there any postulates that no. you, guiding postulates that you start with or how, how no. do you teach no. this or how do you re, yeah, yes. you write about yes. this? Yes, yes. That's a very good question. Uh, um, so I'm not particularly interested in the, in, in the endless the debate uh, of what constitutes a city. Um, I'm actually not particularly interested in either defining the city um, or in the city per se. And I understand the city here as this gigantic accumulation of human and non-human stuff, yeah? uh, uh, which goes from cities like Manchester or, or, or Amsterdam, gigantic concentrations of transformed matter. This is transformed matter that is concentrated in a particular geographical environment and alongside with that and as an integral part of that a massive concentration of people in there too but i'm interested in the process to which the urban become constituted so so what concerns me is the process of urbanization that is the process through which uh, uh, human and non-human stuff gets together is combined together forms an assemblage, a cyborg, whatever you want to call it, an a constellation, as Matthew Gandhi would often, often call it, a constellation of human and non-human stuff that comes together, is assembled together in a very specific, a very concrete and historically changing and often contingent sort of ways. So New York is not Lausanne, is not uh, Hanoi, is not uh, Shanghai, but nonetheless, there are a set of key the processes that um, um, shape uh, and drive the process of, of urbanization. On the one hand, on the other hand, what makes the, ur the urban, again, I, use, I prefer the word the urban rather than the city. The urban is for me also an absolutely central space of your politicization. That it, is historically, geographically, it's not that difficult to, to see how it is the urban to which the political movements emerged, um, 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 made themselves public and fought for forms of the political transformation that could move the system toward, towards more just or equal configurations. If you think of the working class struggle, the feminist, uh, struggle, most of the ecological struggle that actually works, uh, articulates in, operates through the urban. Uh, so, for, so, so for me, and that goes back to almost the classic the Greek agora, so urban space, urban public space has always been the key the terrain to which the politicize, politicization emerges um, and is enacted and occasionally leads to forms of political change and transformation. So in that sense, for me, the urban is also, also vital. It is for me the preeminent space of, the, of politicization. Yeah, we'll come back later on the 
politization and depolitization or apolitization sure. Sure. Uh, of cities. Um, I'm wondering, so you said that the, the last phase, so in the 90s or eight of, uh, 80s was uh, yes. your shift into political ecology, let's say, where you, yes. you really went from space to the, the, the questioning of flows and who are who is affected by the flows yeah. how yes. how other flows are articulated and generated by human activities i guess yes. um was there already a, a discipline of urban political ecology how how does this sphere uh started uh, yes. back in the yes. day yes yes so in in the by the early 80s Um, and, and increasingly so by the late 80s, there was not only in academia, but also in the wider political sphere, an extraordinary critique and attack on uh, certain forms of radical political thinking, in particular Marxism. Also, the collapse of, of, the, of the welfare state system in the, in the West, the disintegration of really existing socialism in the East, the uh, rise of what was then called postmodernist perspectives, etc., launched this, this wholesale critique on, on, on Marxist uh, thinking, both theoretically as well as strategically. Um, and that led to a proliferation of all sorts of other critical perspectives postmodernist post-structuralist post-colonial etc many of which are very important and very interesting i do not want to critique that although i think some of them are very problematic but interesting insights do emerge from it i did not want to go that way because although i could fully recognize some of the inherent weaknesses Uh, in the way in which Marxist theory and certainly its politics uh, had, had unfolded in the 19th and 20th century. I was rather more concerned with and interested in trying to reformulate it and through that push it forward. And it's true, of course, that the, that the ecological question had never been very high on the Marxist political agenda in the, 20th, in the 20th century. There is no doubt about that. Although I would argue it is yet present in 19th century original Marxist thinking. It's there, but it, it, it completely disappeared both in theory and, cert and certainly in practice throughout the 20th century. But I, I, was, I was convinced that it would be possible to reformulate it. And I thought it was absolutely vital to bring the non-human, the ecological, the non-human into social theory, um, precisely because the dynamics of the environment uh, became on the one hand increasingly more problematic. The environmental ecological issue pushed itself uh, uh, increasingly higher on the social and political agenda. Uh, it was a real concern for a growing number of people, A and B, there were of course, uh, Uh, many quite influential and important uh, emerging environmental movements, which mm -hmm. I and many others did consider as possible new political agents and political actors that could move in a direction that would shift, however slightly, or in a bigger way, the existing capitalist socio-ecological co configuration. Uh, so that is where I want, wanted to go. Um, of course, geography, to now speak of the discipline where I was mm -hmm. working in at the University of Oxford at the time, historically, geography had always been the discipline that tries to combine, combine social and physical affairs, but had done so for a long time in extremely problematic uh, ways, uh, of course, in a very empirical, sometimes uh, problematic theoretical ways, but there's always been, there's always been a concern among geographers of how the environmental configuration worked. So it was a natural environment uh, to start thinking again in this way, although using radically different tools. So I was, I was, 
I was doing something really quite simple, I, I, I think. I mean, I had been a PhD student of David Harvey, and David Harvey understands, very much rooted in, in, in Marxism, understands urbanization as being structured in and through the circulation of money and the self-expansion of value in the dynamics of capital accumulation, let's call it economic growth, right? That economic growth and the particular social and political dynamics that underpin the dynamics of economic growth are absolutely vital, absolutely vital to understand not just urbanization, but understand the wider functioning of the combined and uneven development that characterizes capitalism. What I was trying to do was just to look at the uh, at associated flow. David Hardy was looking for money to capital that way and how it circulates. And I think, well, what, do, what happens if I take, let's say, H2O, water, and I follow the flow in the opposite direction and see how the non-human uh, becomes, is a necessary, active, and key ingredient in the way in which this circulation process is organized. And I was very lucky in a way um, through a series of, a series of accidents um, as life goes. I ended up uh, in Ecuador uh, in a big project um, that lasted for four years. I spent altogether two and a half, three years in Ecuador. Uh, precisely at the time that David Harvey and I and, and many of his students and others were beginning to, to think through um, and what would later be called the political ecology. And there had been some, some emerging work in the 1970s and the 1980s, but not very much, but there was some. Uh, just to single a few out, uh, uh, there's Michael Watts, uh, Silent Violence About Famine, etc. classic political ecological study. There is Blakey's classic study on soil soil degradation, soil erosion, from a political ecological perspective. There was some work done in the 1970s um, as well. <clears throat> but to cut a long story short, the first day I arrived in Ecuador, where I'd never been in my life, uh, my friends, as, as happens, you know, you arrive in a city you don't know to start this your project. I had uh, friends and colleagues there who had already been there working for several months and the first day I arrived they, they took me on a tour of the city. <laughs> That's what geographers do. Of course. It? That's what geographers do. We generally look at infrastructures but yeah it's the same. <laughs> it's, the same it's the same thing. So the whole day, the whole day my very good friend uh, in the jeep uh, going from place to place, neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, explaining me all sorts of things, what they were doing in the project, how the city looked like, etc. Uh, I was massively jet lagged uh, because I just arrived. Uh, by five, six o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I was exhausted. And my, my friend, uh, Western male, took me on top of a hill, you know, the classic male gaze to look at the city sort of thing. Thing, you know, at the end of the day, you know, let's now have yeah. the master, the master's view. <laughs> exactly, with a drink and a cigarette, and then exactly say what the plan of the city should be. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So my very enthusiastic friend on the top of the hill was going over the city. I was not paying much attention any longer by that time. I was sitting down, exhausted, and I was looking. It was going on at the foot of the hill. And at the foot of the hill, there were these dozens and dozens of blue. The trucks, all more or less similar, driving up and down. And it was sort of interesting. I thought, what are these trucks doing down there, right? <laughs> so I interrupted my, my friend. I uh, said, what, 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 what's going on down there? So he looked down the hill and he said, they're selling water. And he continued with this <laughs> narrative on the city. And I thought, selling water <laughs> what the heck you know so i i stopped him again i said can you tell me a bit about this selling water business thing so he, he then explained to me what the condition of the city was in terms of access to water that uh uh 35 of the urban population 600 people in a in a in a city small city of two million people had no access to 
piped potable water and consequently in order to get access to uh, their uh, needs for water, they would buy it from the trucks who would go from house to house and, and sell it basically, fill up tankers. And these, these tanker wagons would, 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 would be filled up by water from the water system and then sell it like one would sell ice cream door to door in the neighborhoods where, where there was no access to water and at a cost that was gigantic. So uh, water, I quickly found out, was one of the most hotly contested both mm -hmm. socially and political domains, the terrains in the urban configuration. It was one of the, of the elements around which continuous social contestation, your political action, et cetera, unfolded. So that's when I decided basically that that is what I was going to work on. In Follow the blue trucks, yeah. Follow the blue trucks. <laughs> uh, so I, I had been thinking for two or three years in theoretical, in a theoretical sense about this nature society configuration. And here I, 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 I decided to try to put some empirical substantiation on my theoretical musings by looking at the circulation of water, basically. And I started the next day, I started following drugs. <laughs> so you became a, a metabolic investigator. Was it in uh, uh, Guayaquil? Guayaquil. Yeah. In Guayaquil, Ecuador. I literally became a metabolic investigator. Um, uh, I literally did that both, both historically. So I, I dived into the archives, et cetera, to, try to understand the making of this highly uneven an unequal system of access to water. I quickly discovered that that was the standard condition for most people living in cities in the global south. And that was a problem of global concern uh, that so many people do not and still do not have access to sufficient qualities, uh, sufficient the quantities of water of sufficient the quality. In fact, the absence of access to water is the number one cause of premature mortality. Um, and in cities, there is there is no alternative. You can't dig a well easily <laughs> in the countryside. You can, but in cities are dependent on water being brought in somehow from somewhere. So basically, that's that's what I did. I followed the historical and geographical circulation and metabolism of H H2O from its uh, source where it was extracted uh, to uh, the moment it was discarded as wastewater. Um, but I did not do that um, in the way in which most systems analysis would do it, that is to follow things from one place to the other, sort of stupid. Um, so circulation, I was interested in the social, the cultural and political embodiment of the metabolic vehicles, the pipes, the trucks, the machines, etc., through which water became pumped up, transformed by adding things to it, subtracting things to, to it, how that then uh, um, inserted water in whole, in whole legal configuration of ownership and non-ownership of pricing, etc., of technologies of, of, of a variety of kinds and how at each and every one of those moments, the circulatory metabolism, the word that I usually use, it's, it's about circulation, but in the circulation, it changes. It changes both in its physical, that is biochemical, Characteristic, but also at the same time changes in terms of its cultural significance, its social power relationships that are embedded in it, and its economic uh, configuration. So it's basically uh, that that got me uh, uh, going, empirically speaking, as a urban quote unquote your political ecologist. But I was not again not particularly interested in Guayaquil as a city per se but really how the way in which water became urbanized 
was mm -hmm. structured in and through the processes that were not just local, although they matter too, but was embedded, in fact, in regional, national, and indeed global um, uh, the processes of metabolic circulation, just to give a simple illustration of that. The first public waterworks in Guayaquil were built in 1902. Um, and the capital, just to cut a very long story short, the capital you know, required to uh, build this new infrastructure uh, came from the mass export of cocoa, chocolate. <laughs> so actually the socio-ecological transformation of Ecuador in the direction of cocoa-based plantations geared at export of cocoa for the chocolate eaters of Belgium and Switzerland and, and Spain, et cetera, at the same time resulted in the, in the movement of capital and money that made it possible to urbanize local waters. So these sort of interactions that were multi-scale but always structured through dynamics of metabolic circulatory change is what I was interested in. Um, and that ended up in this book uh, on Guayaquil in 2004. It's funny because uh, I think the first time I, I started reading about urban metabolism is 10 years or so uh, ago. And, and you know, I came from an engineering point of view, so mm -hmm. I was looking at numbers. Yes. And then yes. I think, no, uh, you know, works like yours, works like uh, Matthew Gandhi's yes. had, yes. <laughs> you, you clearly had in the title urban metabolism, yet Yes. It didn't resemble at all with everything else no. I was reading. No, and, I understand. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. it uh, it kind of puzzled me for a long time to 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 accept that actually one metaphor can be used by many people for different Absolutely. urban phenomena, which Absolutely. is which is the the strength and the bane of this field or subfield or however we want to talk about it. Yes. But that ask I'm I'm wondering. Because you started in the 70s, 80s, 90s to work on, on this field. Yes. Similarly, at the, the same time was, let's say, the, the birth of industrial ecology and the people that account stuff. Yes. Uh, yes. And I'm wondering, so yes. in your work, you, you generally cite as well Marina Fischer-Kowalski um, yes. yeah. and her how she read uh, Marx and the Capital and how yes. she situates... Um, yes. The, the metaphor of uh, of metabolism. Yes. Um, we also had Marina on the podcast. I'm wondering yes. how yes. and whether you collaborated with this other sphere of uh, of people who actually did more or less the same thing as you. But I don't uh, think they did yeah. more or less the same thing as as us at all. They did something radically different. They were using the same metaphor to try to capture. That is true. The metabolism. They used the same metaphor, but I would argue they were doing something radically radically different do not i mean for us as i said in the beginning our concern was your political transformation correct. yeah correct in in a radical sort of way that correct. is how can we move toward towards a more uh, democratically equitable and socially inclusive and ecologically sensible local national international configuration that was what drives us that was yeah. not the case for fisher kowalski and her Correct. Say of uh, that was a much more positivist, neutral type of science that has that Correct. was quite quite consciously apolitical or non political. I've nothing against it, but it's something no, very, no, but very but different. It's something very very different. Uh, so on what industrial ecology does, and particularly Fisher Kowalski and her team and impact, and it's quite significant. It's really really important. Uh, work. I've used it myself many, many times. Um, um, uh, I think it's extremely useful. I don't, I don't have anything against numbers and data. <laughs> uh, but she does strange things. There are two strange things that she does. Uh, and not just she. I, 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 I name her as a representative of a particular way of understanding the metabolism and working the metabolism. But in, in her analysis of the historiography of metabolism, she is acutely aware of the origin of metabolism in Marxist thinking and other the critical thinking of, of the 19th century. And it's, she's, she's 
acutely aware in her writings how the thinking about the metabolism at the time was, was very, very sensitive to how we should understand metabolism, not merely as a biological or biochemical, biophysically the process, but that, that the metabolism was also at the same time shaped by the relations of uh, ownership, non-ownership, by, uh, by the state, by forms of regulation, etc. When, when she then started to look at the 20th century, the study, the understanding of metabolism became utterly and completely socially and politically disembodied. It moved from understanding it as a, as a relationally con constituted dynamic to the movement one would see on a Bill Gates input-output spreadsheet. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? So it became solely uh, the study, the empirical study of the movement of matter from place to place and how in that movement matter would take on different technical, chemical, ecological, biochemical configurations. Now, I thought that this kind of empiricist and positivist input-output flow uh, that the industrial ecologists uh, take as their terrain, I find that very interesting because it gives us the cues, uh, 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 clues as to what needs to be understood yeah, the flow that they give me numbers from is absolutely vital because they tell me ah, that has to be understood, explained, and accounted for. Yeah, <laughs> in itself, it's meaningless. It is. It is trivial. It is. It is. It it it, it, it is unimportant uh, in terms of 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 understanding and consequently in terms of grappling with the dynamics that shape this kind of industrial ecology. So in, in other words, what, the, what they consider to be the explanation for me is what needs to be explained. So, yeah, I think so it's the tell, vehicle. Yes, that it's... yes, exactly. So don't tell me that you're doing the same thing. No, something very, very different. No, no. I think <laughs> you, we're using the same vehicle for different reasons. Very uh, different reasons. Very different reasons. And I think today, well, there is also this political industrial ecology field that starts very wobbly to exist with mm, yeah. some case studies, not yes, sufficient. To exist, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. And I think that that is also in, in what you said previously, how technology and technique is not what is going to solve the problems. No. It's the same thing with now we realize more and more studies of measuring flows now say, okay, is this just, or is this, uh, you know, can we stay within the limit? And if we stay within the limits, how does that affect everyone and all of that? So I think yeah. now we, because of external constraints, the questions are converging, uh, perhaps mm -hmm. not um, going to the full potential of saying what is the political and the policies and the you know classes behind it and the, the production yes. who owns the production chains yes. so yes. over there i think there is a lot of education still to be yeah, cross pollinated but, but, but yeah yeah well it, but it, it's not just about cross pollination although that matters of obviously but for people like me how can you begin to begin to understand the fundamental configurations of metabolic transformation without considering ownership, non-ownership, the becoming of ownership, the legal and institutional embedding of ownership. How can you begin to say something, let's say about electrical vehicles without looking at the extraordinary struggle and conflict over owning lithium mines in Chile or, or, or elsewhere. How can you say something about the industrial ecology of the mobile phone uh, without considering the ownership and the gigantic struggle over coltan mines in Central Africa? Now that, that for me is, 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 is worse than meaningless. This is post-truth science because those so-called 
the critical or more the critical industrial ecologies, they do know that has to do with ownership. They do know it has to do with the class, the relationship of who owns nature and who organizes, who has the power to organize the circulatory metabolic flow, etc. They know that. They do not say what they know. Therefore, they're actually, to a certain extent, lying to themselves because they know the truth. Do not speak the truth. And that's what I would argue today is what defines a post-truth science. And I would indeed argue that much of the science that many of us do in the environmental field is post-truth science. And this is, why do you think so? Um, is it because there is just uh, 8,000 words in an article and you cannot have asterisks and nota bene everywhere? Is it because of different conceptions of science? Uh, different conceptions of what is the role of a researcher? What do you think is, is so, behind so, this? So certainly everything that, that you say matters, the, the way people understand science, the conception they have of science, the place they ascribe to science and the wider divisions of labor, etc., all matter in terms of, 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 of deciding what to say as an academic and what not to say, what should be said and what should not be said. So yes, and, and, and usually these different ways of trying to understand or grapple with metabolism, say, or accounted for and explained by the participants in terms of epistemological, ontological, theoretical uh, choices and views. They, they have and 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 that is that is perfectly fine of course that is the more than fine there should be a thousand flowers that bloom around a certain problematic that we all know needs to be taken seriously having said that i do think there's something more at work in this in this um disavowal so to speak it's, it's what i together with many psychoanalysts calls uh, um, fetishistic disavowal Um, uh, the, uh, which basically st stands in or, or means that despite the fact we know very well what the facts are and what constitutes the facts, we act, in the case of academics, we write as if we do not know what these facts are. And there are a whole wide range of reasons uh, uh, that need to be considered in order to understand that. It has to do, among others, with the organization of the political economy of academia. It has to do with organizing the political economy of financing uh, science. It has to do with the political economy and the, and the culture of, of hiring and firing academics, who is entitled to be an academic and who decides uh, uh, who is an academic, I've been extremely lucky in my own career that I hit on a number of the privileged interlocutors who were sympathetic and supported my view of thinking. Many of my generation, my type, failed. Yeah? They were excluded from. And to be absolutely honest, in my 40-year academic career, I have received funding of all manner of organizations, including the European Union. Lots of, I got lots of money from the, from the European Union o over the years, mainly to do ecological, social ecological work. Um, on almost every single one of my applications, I have light of what I'm going to do. I light. Yeah? I think, and I, I do think that most academics know precisely what I'm talking about. Very few dare to admit that what they are saying they want to do and and explain to be as vitally important for the well-being of science and, and the world, they know they're lying because they write this down in order to maximize their chances to get funding. You know, they're trying to imagine, trying to imagine what the master discourse is, the master narrative is. So every single um, 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 uh, academic research project application that I have done was a post-truth application. Now I often sit, I often sit also on the other side of the table 
for, for the research councils locally, nationally, internationally, etc., which I enjoy doing because I think it's important. And I can see the post truth <laughs> <laughs> content dripping from it. Uh, um, and yeah, so I think it's a bit more complicated than just a choice of different conceptual epistemological or ontological framings. I have not, not, much, not, not much difficulty with that. In fact, that should be nurtured, uh, different ways of, of trying to understand, just or grapple with something that we do not know. Uh, but that should be looked at, at, that should not take the place of a critical analysis of the academic, the place and the role of academia research and universities in the present conjunction, which, 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 which nurtures particular ways of understanding, particular ways of knowing, uh, nurtures that by promotions, research money, and all manner of other things, and at the same time, it radically disavows, marginalizes, uh, or makes it more difficult for other views to be heard and said. Um, um, and that is vitally important. And that, I think, is that tension that nurtures a, a regime in which post-truth science has become the hegemonic norm. And the people like me, and there are many like me, I'm not by a long way the only one, luckily, there are plenty, plenty of people like me, uh, but is a minority uh, still, uh, which is really st strange. Uh, I think, given how many academics that are working on environmental and ecological affairs, uh, the number of people that look at the range of perspectives that I also adhere to is marginal. And that effect is non-existent for very, very understandable reasons. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yes, Who would want to change the system, hey? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. E exactly. But if we, if we do not want to, which is fine, which is fine. That's not my concern. That, which is fine. One, of course, does not have to want to change the system. That is fine. What, 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 what I find really yet troubling is not the voice of those who say, I don't want to change the system. That's fine. If that is their, their position. What I'm much more concerned with, or find really problematic, is all those who say the world is in serious environment, is in a serious environmental conditions. If we continue doing what we're doing, there are going to be serious and now well documented uh, ecological and consequently social implications. The climate change is the classic of that kind. Uh, and, and there's therefore a consensus actually among most environmentalists, et cetera, that urgent action is needed, otherwise they're gonna be a disaster. And 80% says, and we can solve that by technical institutional means that do not have to change the system. That's a lie, <laughs> cannot be done. That's a lie. That is a post to lie. And most of those do know it cannot be done through yeah. these technical means. Nonetheless, they keep on insisting that it is well, possible. The, even the word degrowth has now come into the environmental parliament. I, who, I've, <laughs> I've, I've come across that, yes. Which is good, which is good. Who knows where we're going <laughs> to end up. So I think this is a good segue to discuss about post-politics in, uh, in cities. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I remember where, when back in the day you were talking about a politics in cities, so how we were we were asking ourselves, or cities and urban administration were asking us, not whether we wanted the stadium, but what color would we like the stadium? Is it red or is it blue? Yeah. But now you've you're you're talking about post politics. What, what is to talk, talk to us about uh, this, this post politics cities? Yes. Yes. Um. Over the past 20 years or so, there has been a growing awareness and I think a widely shared consensus um, that the people are losing interest 
in the question of politics. Uh, um, they don't do not yet trust politicians any longer. That is the rise of all the populist, usually right wing movements, etc., which are all signs of a uh, deep concern of and distrust uh, uh, by the people, the average person of the political machinery. Um, there's also a very well documented decline related to what I just said in the participation of citizens in the political the processes, even the simple process of voting. And most people are not any longer interested mm -hmm. in it. So political participation is going down rapidly and is generally perceived as problematic in a certain way, the disappearance of the political concerned citizen. Now, what I'm interested in, um, and those who mobilize a term of post politicization they try to account for that disappearance of the political in the expression of and in the everyday life of people. So the argument here is that over the past 20 or 30 years or so, a moment more or less coinciding with the rise and subsequent, sub, subsequent consolidation of neoliberalism, um, um, whereby a particular, a particular form of appropriating nature, a particular form of metabolizing nature, and a particular form of distributing the products of that nature is, 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 is common sensually and unquestionably structured by the market and the private sector. So it's the private sector, the market economy, that is the key mechanism through which the transformation of nature and the allocation of goods and services should, should be organized. There's no alternative to that. So A uh, and B, to the extent that issues, the problems um, are recognized, like for example, a financial crisis is a serious problem, the refugee, crisis, serious problem, we call it a crisis, the climate crisis, serious problem, the COVID crisis, serious problem, etc. So, so, so although it's fully recognized that there are all sorts of issues and problems around, they are usually, and in a dominant way, argue that they can be handled by techno-managerial manners. So, I, a combination of technological change and innovation and institutional adaptation will provide us with a configuration that will lead to managing or dealing with the situation that we're in. That is what I call post politics. Yeah. Post politics is the combination of a consensus making about something, refugees are a problem. The climate is a problem. There's a consensus about that. No one disagrees with that, or very few. And B, that this consensually established problem, that can be dealt with by a combination of technical and managerial institutional configurations. Now, the underlying assumption of that of course, is that society cannot be changed. We can only change the institutional and technical conf configurations. So it's a sort of, it's what, what I call techno-managerialism. So most of the problems are dealt with by techno-managerial configurations in which the public, to the extent that they're invited to participate, and they are often invited to participate, they can choose the color blue of that, etc. Right? Uh, so you can't question the framing of the problem and the trajectory of the solutions that are proposed. You can, you can deal with minor technical and institutional adjustments to participation. The framing cannot be done. So it's what the French once upon a time called la pensée unique. Yeah? There, there, there is a unitary way of doing things. 
Now, that system, such a consensual system, announces the end of the political. So, when, I, when we say that post year politicization as a form of techno managerial management um, signals a process of depoliticization, the question then is what is being de depoliticized? Or, in other words, what is being often forgotten is how we conceive of the political. And that is the key issue. Right? So, the, the disappearance of the political, whereby we understand the political as the signal of radical disagreement that cuts to the social. In other words, in that sense, the political is precisely what the democratic recognized, that people disagree, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that they disagree, that there are heterogeneous views, positions, etc. And the democratic, the political insist uh, uh, um, 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 and it, it, it does so without any foundation. The democratic, the political insist that we're all equal in our radically heterogeneous wishes, desires, views, etc. So this techno-managerial post politicization radically undermines the very, very architecture and principle of the democratic. And again, it's very important to understand the difference between the democratic as the expression, the egalitarian expression of disagreement. Uh, and we have to distinguish that from the democracy as the instituted forms of rulemaking and management, etc. Uh, uh, so the political is not something that unfolds in parliaments or council chambers, etc. That's politics. We understand politics. The French have a, have a beautiful, such a beautifully gendered language. So the instituted forms of managing public affairs, they call la politique. Yeah. And the Spanish call it la politica. Yeah. The, the political as the expression of egalitarian disagreement, the French call le politique, or the Spanish lo politico. Yeah. So the political has increasingly disappeared, has been disavowed, has been marginalized, has been sidetracked to such an extent that these days the notion of the political as a democratic a procedure is not any longer recognized. So it's precisely this, this erosion of the democratic, we argue, that leads to a disintegration of the belief in the importance of politics by average citizens, which drives them into the hands of populist uh, uh, um, right-wing nationalists that leads to the depoliticization in which many academics contribute to further sustaining this depoliticized configuration, but this depoliticized configuration that characterizes urban policy, but also environmental policy, that is that only one thing can be done in order to secure the future of Lausanne, it has to be a sustainable competitive city, just like Amsterdam, Manchester, yeah, and you, and you develop a sustainable competitive uh, uh, city through a particular set of managerial and technical interventions that articulate with the supreme power of private capital and the free circulation of capital, etc. That's one of the key vehicles to do, is to do it. And there's no alternative. Yeah. If, if you think there's an alternative, you're either an idiot, uh, a child, or you've forgotten that the 20th century is forever over. Now, now the political as the expression of disagreement cannot be suppressed the whole time, particularly in a configuration, a post-political configuration, whereby social and other inequalities, social class, gender, and other inequalities are not only there, they're deepening. They're getting worse, both at a local scale as well as on a transnational scale. Uh, uh, scale. Now, here we have a, a, a great paradox. 
The culture of neoliberalism says we're all equal. We're all free to do whatever we want, yet that very, the practice of neoliberalism produces increasingly greater inequality and in egalitarian heterogeneity, in egalitarian heterogeneity. That then leads to a, a situation in which under post your political conditions, the political returns in the form of violent outbursts or radical outbursts of discontent. We've seen over the past 10 years, both in a positive sense, but also in a negative sense, the emergence as an urban phenomenon too, of all manner of radical discontent and radical disagreement, the indignados in Spain, the outrage in Greece, the Occupy movement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes very successful. Look what happened yesterday in Chile <laughs> with the presidential election after two years of intense urban struggle of a politicizing kind. So it sometimes has positive effects. In any case, these uprisings, these, these manifestations of radical discontent of which uh, Extinction the Rebellion and Youth for Climate or other expressions, so to speak, are a signal for me of the failure of this post-political cozy consensus. The problem now is that the re-emergence of the political in the form of those, those outbursts of discontent or disagreement are not sufficiently leading to sustained political action and organization capable of changing, however minimally, the socio-ecological conditions of our cities and beyond. That in a nutshell is what I, what I and my colleagues understand by post depoliticization and how it helps us to understand what happens in cities, what happens, helps us to understand what happens with the environment and what helps us to understand the emergence of new forms of discontent, uh, both on the, the progressive side, but also on the regressive, more populist side. So perhaps then to, to conclude what we learned and what you learned, how do you act then? How do you guide action through through yeah. knowing how it intertwined, so with the global yes. local elements, yes. Yes. The, yes. The, the the frame that you have put as well, yes. Yes. The, well, given yes. the case studies, the flows, the yes. Yes. How, how would you move forward in this element? Yes, yes. It, it depends, of course, very much who I am speaking to, uh, because the audience that you speak to uh, usually has already a view as to how to proceed. <clears throat> so let me, since we're talking about your metabolism and urban your metabolism, let's take that as, as, the, as the vehicle. So um, social change does not take place on podcasts or through podcasts. Or libraries. Unfortunately, right? yeah. Unfortunately, but yeah. That would have uh, been good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but they do matter. Neither you nor I would do what we're doing if we thought it was completely irrelevant what we're doing. So um, the point I really want to make is that uh, dynamics of social and social ecological change reside in action of a particular kind, your political action. I'll come in a moment to what I mean by your political action, not in other forms of action. So that means that, first of all, one has to radically reject um, forms of action that are being defended as potential solutions to a serious issue and displace those on the terrain of the political instead. Let me exemplify that. Um, there is a great consensus that forms of individual and sometimes the collective um, intervention might help with the social ecological condition the city is in. My preferred example is here is the combination of recycling, um, not flying, um, 
uh, increasing the ethical awareness of people um, to change their individual behavior. And many people they believe that this is vital to change the coordinates of the social ecological system. Not true, it's a lie. It's a lie, it's just not a plea for not recycling, etc. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. I do that too. Yeah, I, I try to be a good ecological citizen, but I have absolutely no, uh, and I can I can demonstrate that too. Yeah, believe that that would contribute to transforming uh, society, and then on a more the collective level, the technological fix. Today, electrical vehicles or seem to be. Uh, uh, talked about as the ecological panacea for for cities the world around, uh, and I think that's a lie. That's a lie. A, there's not enough electricity to power all these ele electrical vehicles to to replace internal the combustion uh, engines. And what are you going to do with the with the socio ecological dispossession that is taking place all around the world to produce? The resource to get the resource to get our electrical vehicles going. So we should stop with seeing the technological as the panacea. Um, and by extension, therefore, I would argue the problem of the climate is not CO2 or methane, it's somewhere else. CO2 or greenhouse gases are the symptom, <laughs> are the symptom of a condition. It is not the alpha and the omega, the same if you're interested in H2O, water, as, as I am, if you want to change the problematic, highly uneven and literally genocidal form in which we organize the circulatory metabolism of water, we should stop talking about water. Stop talking about water. That's not where the issue is. So that's step number one. Yeah, to really yeah, critically examine most of the assumptions that most of the people uncritically accept. That individual behavior change combined with technical managerial transformations will deal with the problem. It will not. It will not, yeah, but it's easy to think that. So that's number one. Number two then is to, is to think and act the politically. Now, political acting is something that always happens in common. You don't do that alone. That is a collective the process, which unfolds in public space. It is visible. It's a performance. It's, it's, it's like a theatrical performance in the street, in the square, etc. cetera. Um, so the nurturing, the participation, and the further mobilization of forms of public acting in space is absolutely vital, number two. Number three, that this means uh, uh, Cutting through individualistic and, and identitarian arrangements and produce a collective, albeit heterogeneous, the collective that acts in the name of equality, democratic equality. Number three, number three. Uh, number four, number four, then think about how to sustain that so that it becomes. Uh, um, 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 effective in beginning to change, however small, the institutional and, te and technological architecture, because that is what is needed, is a fundamental change of that. That is what needs to be done. Now, that is difficult. That is uh, um, um, not always self-evident. Self it's actually often very dangerous, because we do know <laughs> that if that form of acting uh, unfolds in space, the powers that be will come down. They are rarely successful, but occasionally they are. And again, I would argue that, that our, our urban histories demonstrate that. You know, what the forms of egalitarian, the political acting historically, whether we can learn from the past, uh, is that they sometimes are successful. Think of the successes of the labor movement, uh, the feminist movement, the, uh, uh, the African-American civil rights movement, they all share the same base uh, configuration of principles that I just out, out, outlined. Uh, it was each time about egalitarian inclusion and how through these demands uh, and mobilizing the power of the multitude, 
one began to change the institutional configuration for the better. That is what is needed. So on the one hand, we should stop doing what we're doing <laughs> uh, uh, in a, as, as, as intellectuals that, uh, and, 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 as, and, and to start thinking about what we do know is absolutely vital. That is the political the procedure to which social, institutional, and consequently ecological change is animated. And that's the only hope. Otherwise, we should forget about it. <laughs> yeah. We should forget about it. Yeah. Uh, um, fi finally, on what to do is to um, give up on our fantasies. Um, much of, of. All of them? No, 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 no. Well, no, some, some have to be fully, fully endorsed. No, 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 some of the dominant fantasies that legitimize um, uh, why we should do something about the urban environmental death condition. Why? <laughs> why <laughs> are so many people concerned about this in a variety of ways, from deep theory, radical thinking to engineering, and, uh, and everyone else. You know, why do we feel we need to do that? What is the leg legitimizing foundation for this? And I would argue there are two key um, arguments that underpin the legitimacy of social environmental action. First, the first is, if we do not do something now, there might be really serious difficulties and problems coming in the future, the kind of apocalyptic imaginary or the dystopian imaginary, uh, which means that um, 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 there is a dystopian future coming, but it can still be avoided. It's a lie. Half of the world's population already lives in the dystopian socio-ecological condition. They're already there, it's too late. So, so there's a particular fantasy sustained by a, by a particular ideology and view of an apocalypse to come in the future. Now, for many people in the world, the apocalypse is already there. Uh, and if you start looking at the urban ecological, social ecological condition from a perspective that for a, a serious part of the population is already too late, or they are already suffering seriously from the existing social ecological condition. Well, if you start thinking about the environmental problem from that perspective, electrical vehicles don't sound as the solution any longer, do they? Uh, the second fantasy is that, of course, we have to avoid this, um, this future scenario, this dystopian future scenario in the name of the people, in the name of, of civilization. Humanity, yeah. Humanity, <laughs> humanity, yeah, in the name of humanity. This, of course, is predicated upon the presumption that humanity in the sort of Western sense uh, exists, of a sort of shared values, interest, etc. That, that actually exists. Now, historical geographical evidence should, shows that except for a few pockets here and there, that humanity does not exist. Humans are bloody animals to other humans, right? And that our only hope is, therefore, uh, not to save uh, humanity that should not be safe, safe because it's never been there, but to construct a humanity as a future the project. Now, the construction of a humanity, which is about the construction of a people in a political sense, is a political yeah, process. Now, so I would argue that if one changes the fantasy around which the need for the intervention is legitimized from this dystopian future to an already existing uh, 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 catastrophe on the one hand, and on the other hand, <coughs> that there is no humanity to be safe, but that perhaps might be a, a humanity that can be constituted. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. That will, that will immediately lead to a set of different interventions, policies, technologies, etc. 
So that would be my advice and suggestion to those who find our kind of arguments interesting. Two last very sp short questions. Um, so is there something particular that you want to work on 2022 and yeah. perhaps some books or articles or videos or films that you would like to recommend to go further in this topic? Uh, oh, that's, that's okay. The first one was, was, was the ease. What do I want to work on? I'm working on, on two things at the, at the moment that I hope to continue. I hope one of them will lead eventually to a book. My biggest concern and interest at, at the moment is something that I briefly touched upon in our conversation, which is the disjunction between what we know and how we act. There's this, this psychological dissonance, is what psychologists call it. Fetishistic disavowal is what psychoanalysts call it. We say one thing, and we act in a different sort of, sort of way. So it's a well-known uh, condition, so to speak, but I think it's now become uh, quite dominant, uh, particularly in, in, in questions of the environment, the climate change, et, et cetera. And I try to understand the political meaning, origin and implications of that fetishistic disavowal. And I'm trying to mobilize because that's the only place I could find the, the glimpse of an answer to that is the mobilization of the Lacanian psychoanalysis to the your problem of the non-performativity of climate change interventions. Because that is, I think, the greatest your problem we are faced with. We see the numbers, we see the facts yeah. of climate change. Yeah, they, they get worse day by day by day. Uh, it's easy to demonstrate. Uh, on the other hand, there is this great concern, universal concern with the climate uh, manifested in the successive COP meetings. We had COP26 in Glasgow just a few months ago, last month. Uh, so despite the facts and despite the uh, universal concern, nothing is happening. So over the past 20, 30 years, if you look at the climate parameters, they have gone from bad to worse when it's not changing at all. So there is a serious gap, a fetishistic disavowal. And I think a political mobilization of Lacanian psychoanalysis might help us to elucidate that. And through that, to, to try to reignite yet again uh, uh, thinking the environment yet politically, but not necessarily in the ways we used to do it in the, in, in, in the 20th century. The second thing I am writing is uh, about enjoyment, uh, which, which is also trying to deal with this, this conundrum, this paradox, that so many people care for the environment and that things are getting worse day by day. Um, so, I am trying to mobilize the Lacanian concept of enjoyment um, um, and how that helps to drive particular types of action and, in, and interventions and exclude other actions and interventions. So the working title of that paper is Enjoying the Climate Change. <laughs> um, and you can illustrate that through the cultural the terrain. Right? I love movies. Um, and I think movies are very useful. And many of us like disaster movies. How often have we not seen Los Angeles or any other city or the world go under through an ecological environmental catastrophe? viruses, aliens, fire, uh, earthquakes, uh, you name it, uh, and we can't get enough. <laughs> we can't get enough. And there's always one but, more, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's always one more coming. So it's, it's an endless fascination with uh, this kind of disasters and dystopia. There's also endless fascination with, 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 with the new technologies, with Elon Musk and his uh, dreaded Tesla, endless fascination. 
uh, with an endless fascination with the, uh, 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 the climate movements, uh, the, the Greta Thunbergs and, and associates, which are fantastic what they're doing. Um, nonetheless, despite the endless fascination, the enjoyment, you know, so the enjoyment we find in the leveling in these sort of things, actually take the attention away from enjoying what we really should enjoy, what I would argue we should learn to enjoy, that is how to make uh, socially more inclusive, egalitarian, and environmentally sensible world. That is what desire ought to be articulated around. And the moment you start thinking about desire in these terms, enjoyment of a catastrophe movie, of the enjoyment of the Tesla as a panacea, quickly dissipates. We should knock on doors of uh, advertisement companies to learn about this desire and how to. Oh, they know that full well. Yeah, exactly. They know, no, exactly. They know that that's full why, well. <laughs> that's why I that say that. Well. Yeah. They know that full well. Yeah. yeah. So you that enjoys movies, any ap uh, post-apocalyptic -ap movie that you would like to oh, to, <laughs> to share? There's, there is so many. There is so many. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is so many. Ah, the one one that I really like. It's, it's, it's an old old one. Um, total recall, mm -hmm. total, total recall of the early, the first version, not the new one. The okay. first version was a beautiful, perfect class analysis of the political ecological condition on Earth. Uh, although it took place on Mars, it had all to do with with air and water and politics. I would still rec recommend total recall. Uh, the first, the first version uh, of that is one of the great yeah, political ecological uh, movies of all times. There are plenty of others. There's an other one that I would, that I think I would recommend, but I haven't seen it yet. It's now in the cinemas. Uh, I wanted to go yesterday, but as as you know, I'm sitting in Amsterdam, and since yesterday morning five o'clock. <laughs> We're in an almost complete lockdown, so I could not go to that particular movie yesterday, uh, which is "Don't Look Up." Okay. Uh, it is. It is in all movies now, and if you're not in a lockdown, you, I'm sure you can find it in the cinemas now. The "Don't Look Up" is a, a metaphor, I think, for the the climate condition that we are in. I think it's very funny and apparently it's very good, but I haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to see it at the first opportunity that arises. That is the first moment I'm allowed out of my flat again into a public space. Thanks so much, Eric, for everything that uh, we discussed so far. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure uh, for me too. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I hope it was useful, but I certainly enjoyed it. It was for me and I hope for everyone as well. I, I hope you liked this, uh, this episode and uh, I'll see you in two weeks for another discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.